is a presentation of the iRacing Esports Network. So, you want to race in NASCAR. The road starts here. Introducing the E-NASCAR at Night Series powered by iRacing. This is the gateway for all aspiring 13 to 16 year olds. Starting June 20th, ignite your dreams of one day racing in the top tiers of NASCAR. Go to www.iracing.com slash ignite for full details. So what are you afraid of? Those feelings are made of. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. Four more kilometers. Oh, they oh, caught! They caught! This time, like the last time, I'm moving so fast, I'm ready to run. Cronky! Stabs the insider, Hershey's off! Passenger throws the block, and he will keep him behind him. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down. Hand over my crown. This racetrack is all about speed. It really, really is. Welcome to Monza. Welcome to the iRacing Le Mans series here on Racebot TV, streaming live on the iRacing Esports Network. As well, it's Wilvinson along with Conor Manic and Jack Styles. They'll be taking over commentary in just a couple of moments time, but we are getting ourselves ready for round number seven of the championship. 60 minutes worth of racing around what is on paper a very simple track. But in reality, it is far from that because this track has got three very different chicanes. Turn number one, they reprofiled that one in 2000. And then from then on, it became a, a symbol, basically, of working these cells through and slowing it down to about 45 miles an hour. The second chicane, the Ascari chicane, well, that's one that most drivers should hit. Then the third chicane, so the Ascari chicane is the third chicane. We've got that one wrong. Oops, it's easy. The third chicane, the Ascari chicane, get that one right. Who knows what will happen next? Going to hand it over to the commentary team. Then that is Corey Manic and Jack Stars, and they will be here for you right about now. The home of Italian motorsports, one of the tracks in the calendar with the uh, fastest average speed over the lap. What an event to start us the second half of the season here at the RS in Monza. Monza is always a very interesting circuit, especially with this LMP1 machinery. It is home to the World Endurance Championship Prologue for this year. And by the looks of it, at the moment, Patrick Wolf is gonna be heading up the grid. He's got a nice sizable advantage at the front. One of the things I have noticed throughout qualifying Connery is that the Audis we've seen struggle so far this season at quite a lot of the circuits here, they're starting to creep up the order. One is in sixth. Yeah, exactly. We've got a couple of other Audis in the field as well. We've got uh, 
Uh, we've got the LDR 18 of Stephen Bailey down in P number 8 at the moment and Cyandra P number 9 in qualifying as there's a couple of drivers out there just completing uh, their flying laps. Dennis Grabrowski heads his way across the line. Only good enough for P number 6 though in his uh, Porsche 919 hybrid. We have a couple of the GTE cars ending their way across the line as well. Barry Morrison only good enough for P number 32 at least in the overall standings right now uh, as those seconds start to take away Jack. So any driver that's out there on track right now which is pretty much none of them now since they all have slowed down to a halt this will actually be end up being your full qualifying grid so qualifying over there jack uh what are you expecting from this race i am expecting an hour of very very high pace race especially here at bonza very fast circuit there's not many sections where you do slow down and where you do it's a very very heavy braking zone you're going to have to watch turn number one the very anti diretophilio that very famous right left chicane that's going to be quite a big bottleneck for all of your classes let's just take ourselves through your starting grid for all three classes here today in the LMP1 field, Patrick Wolf will take pole position and Marcus Hamilton will line up next to him on the front row. So PRT and uh, Fresmas Mervano there looking to dogfight at the front of the field. Patrick Wolf does have help though in the film of his teammate Fabrice Cornelis lines up on the second row, P number three. Kazuki Umashima there mixing things up in P number four for Radicals Online. Then further back, you got Michael Schwanzel there, P number five. Dennis Grabowski, P number six. Ishmael Yakubu, P number seven. David Saranzo, good enough for P number eight in qualifying. Then you've got Stephen Bailey, Cy Andra, uh, Antoine Cousin. You've got Jeff Giassi, Dominic Push, and Oli Foka rounding out your 14 car LMP1 field. Then looking back to your LMP2 class, Carly Janssen gaining pole position in that particular division for that Radicals Online machine, a 136 flat for him. Robert Harris will line up on the front row of LMP2. You've got Carlo Labati there, as well as Patrick Richter down in the second row of your LMP2s. You've got uh, also got Johan Half, row three with Rene Penquit, Tanner McCulloch and Luke Gilardo and Gullis Mate will round out your 10 car LMP2 field so a little bit of a thin field for LMP2 but they can still get us some fantastic action but cycling things down now to your GTE field Gianni Vecchio driver of the number one machine gets himself pole position with Thibault Kazubon lining up on the front row with Gianni Florian Durand and Samuel Roth will consist of the second row in your GTE field. Antia Ahola and Christopher Dambietz there further back. You've got Bastian Remis, you've got Carlos Diegues, Barry Morrison and Chris Fuller, Aidan Campbell. Bruno Fontalba, Jorge Valls there in P number 37 overall, so expect him to make his way up through that GTE field. You've got Jan Sienkowski, Stephen Ebert, Andy Pez, Christian, uh, Christian Boog, you've got Timo Gorlick and Dennis Branch there as well. You've got Simeon Lynch rounding out your entire 44 car field right at the back of the GTE division as the cars will start to roll off. Only a short pace lap here at Monza. down towards the Parabolica, the gold GTEs were still there, the, the Ascari chicane, but only a couple moments now before that, uh, that pace car rounds the Parabolica, dives down on towards the lane, and we can get this one green flag racing. Only an hour in this event, one schedule slot for all three classes. So not much leeway in terms of the strategy, it's basically a dog fight right until the end. Patrick Wolf will get himself going with green flag racing here at Mons, and that's a terrible start for Marcus Hamilton. We've got three wide, pretty much immediately for P number two in class three LMP1. Kazuki Umashima looking for the race speed potentially, but he'll sell for a battle for P number two now with Fabrice, Fabrice Cornelis trapped on the outside, will become the inside for the second apex of the Retrofilio Chicane. Marcus Hamilton has dropped from the front row down to battling for P number four now with Dennis Gabrowski on the inside of Curva Grande. You can see both 
both cars catching right up to the back of Kazuki and uh, Cornelius. Yes, side by side, both uh, groups of cars will go down into what's well, going to be the Delaraja chicane. But meanwhile, you've got also got your starts for your other classes as well. Kali Jansen still leads the way in LMP2, followed by Robert Harris, Carl Labati, and uh, the car of Johan Half were battling down into the Delaraja there as uh, Johan Half manages to get himself up into P number three as Labati now has to defend from Patrick Richter in the number 17 car. But looking back to your GT field now, Gianni Vecchio still leads the way in that one. Kazu, uh, Kazu Bon, P number two still. Florian Durant, P number three. And Sanya Rof, P number four. All holding position still. So your GT3s were the quietest on the start. But that LMP1 start from the uh, front couple of rows, Jack, that was just insane. Yeah, awesome start by those guys. They're now coming around to complete their first lap of the race. Very high pace in this LMP1 class, up to 310 kilometers an hour at the end of the straight. Patrick Wolf leads across the line to complete lap number one. He's in a nice, comfortable position over for, over for his teammate, old Fabrice Cornelis. Two seconds to the good for, uh, for Patrick Wolf. But if you look at the battle for Hein, Kazuki Ubershima, you're going to see two lights. He did car around. That's one of the Trust Fast Mavano cars. Oh, boy. That's no, sorry, that's the Simitok car. David Taranzo looking like he's in the wall big time. Yeah, that's a big incident coming down into uh, into the Fisher Kane. It was contact with the car aside. Andra coming over the uh, over the pit exit line there. So Saranza trying to block the lane, just tracking uh, right. Uh, well, drivers right a little bit too much there. The cars came together, and uh, Saranzo had a very very he heavy impact at the barrier. Yeah, blew the engine on impact by the looks of it. That number 28 machine is not seen, not seen the best of days. So Andra is back going again. Heavy damage to his Audi R18 LMP1 on the rear right corner, which is obviously where he made contact with the driver of David Saranzo. Unlucky incident, and it just shows that these drivers do start need do start. They need that start to be patient. They need it to be nice and clean. That's not what you want to do. And for Sandra, he's now going to lose time. Not only with the damage, but having to fight his way through the LMP2 traffic. He hasn't got much to deal with as he heads out of Lesmo number two. But he has got time to make up. Battle for P number two overall, though. Kazuki Umashima versus Marcus Houghton. Marcus Houghton almost breezing by there down the inside at the Parabola. Okay, using the overtake button out of the Ascari Chicane. And Dan Skabrowski will also attempt to pick up a position here. But here comes a reply now from Umashima. Here comes the run from Umashima. Pass straight, straight back past Marcus Houghton. Using his overtake uh, ERS reserves at a different point on the circuit. Manages to get himself back onto that final step of the post. Podium for now. A little bit of scrapping behind though. Grabowski had to take a little bit of an alternate line coming through the uh, the Retafilia chicane. Michael Schwanzel there uh, having a pretty good run coming up into uh, well, in P number 6 at the moment. So he has dropped one position, but uh, to keep with uh, the, these sorts of uh, drivers with, uh, with, with that sort of caliber at the front, it's not a bad job at all. No, it did not. And he's having a good battle with Dennis Grabowski at the moment to head into Lesmo 1 for the third time. And this hybrid power and that boost that they get as Grabowski goes very wide into the gravel, holds on to the position for now. But the boost that they get is going to be interesting as Grabowski again wide. Everyone running very wide out of Lesmo 2. They want to be careful there not to pick up any floor damage. And you can see ahead Umashima and Marcus Hamilton into the Ascari chicane. Not going to get a move done. I think for Kazuki Umashima, he's just trying to use his hybrid at the right point. But he does have to remember that Marcus Hamilton will be able to use it back. And if you use it on that front straight, you get an advantage because you can use whatever's left on the lap that you're currently on. And then you get it reset for the next lap. So you do technically or could get two boosts of hybrid and that could run into your strategy much better. Dennis Grabowski onto the rear of Kazuki, Kazuki Umashima now as they cross the line. Not going to look like he's going to make a challenge. Umashima though, hard on the battery power, 330 kilometers an hour. Marcus Hamilton going to hold the inside line, forcing Kazuki to the outside. Not going to get it down into that first chicane. Want to be careful, because that is definitely a bottleneck point there, Connery. And if you get a touch there, it's not just two cars that can get involved. You can actually hold up half of the field. Yeah, it can become a parking lot re parking lot relatively quickly down into that first chicane, especially on rather chaotic race starts. But the thing is, uh, we didn't see that here today, which is a, a pretty good thing. More runners in this race is obviously uh, much, <laughs> much, much better thing to have. As uh, looking back to your GT field, in fact, that's a battle for the race lead going on between Gianni Vecchio and uh, Kazu Bon. They're down towards the curve of Parabolica. 
Kazubon just has to fall behind a little bit just for now, but the thing is he does have the benefit of just sitting in that slipstream, so we'll close right up to the back of uh, of the car ahead of Gianni Vecchio is in fact he may actually he's he's teasing with the move at the moment but I think he's just staying behind and uh, trying to get a little bit of fuel saving done there Jack and uh, then try to uh, complete the jump over the, um, in the stops yeah I think that's what he needs to do drivers behind Simeon Lynch off the circuit in the dirty three wide as they come down to turn one you've got three wide two wide further behind in your GTE field this is your battle for by the looks of it, position number 11, they've got to all work themselves down two by two into that turn one chicane. Looks as though the Ford of Aidan Campbell has managed to come off best from that one, getting himself a few more positions. This is a good scrap in your mid-pack battle for your GTE race lead, though. Jimor Casuon has not found a way past Gian Gianni Vecchio. Gianni Vecchio, actually, he's all of a sudden got a challenge for the top spot in this class, Connery, and it's not something that he's been used to so far this season. Yeah, exactly. It's been relatively comfortable for him at the front of the field, but Monza can act as a, a little bit of an equalizer sometimes. So this is a good opportunity for Casio Bond to show exactly what he's made of. Com won't complete the pass up towards the Ascari chicane. You can just see him just lifting out the throttle, also breaking a little bit earlier uh, than Gianni Vecchio coming up into the braking zone for the Ascari chicane. So there's just uh, uh, all the signs of uh, a little bit of patience, a little bit of fuel saving going on there for the driver of the number five. This will be very telling when he heads down the pit straight next time. A little bit of weaving down the straight though for Gianni Vecchio trying to make the toe but uh, that is not going to be all that effective as they run into the Parabolka. Take that characteristic wide line off of the corner. Carry as much momentum as possible heading down the pit straight now. And Kazubon still very close. Uh, this will be very telling whether he goes for this move or not. It just confirms our suspicions that he might be staying behind for the field. No, he's going to go for the move down the inside. And that is the race lead now gotten by Kazubon. Gianni Vecchio didn't really fight that one there. Just let Kazubon through there, Jack. Yeah, I think that was more of a, well, if I sit behind Kazubon, I know he's going to be a very similar pace to me. I can save some fuel. Maybe get him on the undercut on the pit stop, or maybe he just knows that into turn number one at this point in the race, it's not worth it. We haven't even had the first 10 minutes so far. This P1 battle is letting the drivers of Umashima Adonadiola as, yes, Umashima, what's happened here? Oh. Down into the Red Tefilio chicane. He's had an instant with a bit of the, the GTE traffic. In fact, he got a little bit of a punt there from Dennis Grabrowski as well. That basically sent him uh, into the GTE traffic ahead of him. That is a bit of a, a cluster there down in, the, uh, down in the first chicane. We'll get the replay up on screen for you now. And uh, wow, what do you make of that one, Jack? I make of that that it looks as though Dennis Grofsky just got a little bit late on the brakes, which is very easy to do, especially at the speeds that they're running at, 200 miles an hour. It looks as though he was trying to avoid. There is cars on the inside, of course, and for Kazuki Yamashima, he does get put forward a little bit. And for the 38 Ford, well, just in the blind spot on turning and not much more that they can do. And yeah, for Kazuki Yamashima, he goes for a trip around. For Dennis Grofsky, he carries on, works his way through that traffic. But for the number 13, that has absolutely dampered his race. He has heavy damage having to run very slowly. And for Aiden Campbell, he obviously is going to be picking up some damage from that one. Yeah, the LMP ones are actually very, very quick in terms of uh, catching the GTE class. Uh, of course, with the uh, very, very high average speed over a lap, that's going to happen a lot faster here than it perhaps would in some other circuits. There's a little bit of a brief free wide down in Sylvester Filio as Marcus Hamilton trying to get past the battling GTE battle here. Gianni Vecchio versus Kazubon, and uh, Kazubon again just has to fall behind, and uh, perhaps that wasn't his fault this time because the prototype trying to make his way, uh, trying to make their way through on him. But he might have an opportunity now down into the Della Roja. What will De Gianni Vecchio do here? Does he take defensive light? Nope. No need since Kazubon dropped off before the breaking zone even started. So it's an interesting dynamic going on, especially in the GTEs, Jack, with the uh, uh, with with the, the, the patience game going on, with the fuel game going on potentially as well. It's uh, starting to become strategic in that respect, even though it's only a one-stop race. Yeah, the one-stop race is important because that one stop will come towards the end of the race in the latter half. You do have to be you do have to watch these class though, because at Monster it's gonna be a higher fuel burn. Your leader, or sorry, that's Dennis Kabrowski of Pure Racing Team currently working his way through that leading pack, getting past fourth and third position. 
He just needs to get himself around. Almost contact into very close into Ascari at that time. But for GTE, fuel saving has commenced. The more you can save, the better off you will be at the end of this event. Because the short pistol we have to take. But as I said here, fuel burn is higher. Expect fuel saving to happen in the lmp ones as well. They might struggle to make it the distance by one lap or so. So maybe some bad strategy calls may come out of that class. If you see car spinning around the 27, 28 minute mark, you almost know that they're going to have to fuel save to the end. And that is not what your leader of Patrick Wolf or Fabrice Cornelis, who is currently in second place, will want to do. Because they know that Marcus Hamilton is sitting behind, waiting in third and ready to pick up the pieces. A pretty close train going on right now for P number four in your LMP1 class. This consists of Dennis Grabowski, Schwanzel, Giassi, and Stephen Bailey at the tail end of this train. And uh, Jeff Giassi has made some impressive moves through the field, getting up from P number 12 up into P number 6. So that's a net gain of six positions already for the driver of the number 15. And he might be looking for more, you know, as he has a, well, makes a little bit of a mare there of the, uh, <laughs> of, of the Della Roger chicane. Gives Stephen Bailey the opportunity down the inside at the first Lesmo. That's an optimistic move down through there. We'll almost bring it side by side for the second as well. But has to abort the move there as uh, actually he's going to get the run off the corner potentially as well but no Jesse uses the RS in the uh, the ERS in reply uh, to try and refuse that move uh, that potential move from Stephen Bailey up towards the Ascari chicane now this battle has separated out from a train of far a, tra a train of four into two groups of two here comes the move ahead though potentially for Schwanzel over Dan Grabowski defensive move there for, uh, for Grabowski taking the inside line for the power of Olga Schwanzel goes deep on the brakes so around the outside which does become the optimal line through the latter part of the parabolica so he will get off the corner with the uh with the better momentum but grabowski also just can't keep up with the straight line speed at the moment and that means that schwanzel is through pretty easily up into p number uh p number four now which is a fantastic effort from the driver of the 27 battling behind though between giassi and stephen bailey down into the red to filio so close to making contact in fact they did have a little bit of a tap coming through there but giassi will come out on top defending his position yeah it looks as though stephen bailey's look why try again through the curve of grande Anton cuisine has now been brought into this battle the number 44 porsche 919 two different types of LMP1 machinery going head to head and you can see the difference in certain places the Audi is slightly better through the corners I'd say but off of the corners and down the straights the Porsche does hold a little bit more Stephen Bailey still trying through Lesmo 1 looking not going to be able to make a move into number 2 and Michael Schwanzel has now got away from Dennis Kabrowski Kabrowski has nothing to answer for the number 27 Stephen Bailey though on the hybrid boost I think he might be saving it for the straight because he knows that he has to manage it a bit more on the Audi Looks as though number 15 of Jeff Giassi is going to hold the inside line into Ascari. Go defensive. That's what he needs to do. Stephen Bailey not going to be able to answer to this one. Especially not. Antoine Cuisine now. Has he got anything to offer to this battle? Looks as though Giassi is going to go to the inside. No, Bailey's looking. Not going to get the move done into Parabolica this time. It just looks as though Stephen Bailey cannot answer Jeff Giassi off of Parabolica. I don't think he's going to be able to do it. He does have the run actually on the inside line there, but they'll go three wide coming down the pit straight. There goes Antoine Cousin, which is a, a car that is also involved in this battle, in fact. So they get the 2 for 1 special down the uh, driver's right hand side down the pit straight. Bailey will actually uh, get the position over G uh, Giassi coming down on the brakes in towards the Retifilio. So that particular battle, that particular train has all been shuffled within a couple of seconds there. As Bally even further down your MP1 field, as someone has to actually take to the escape road coming through the right to feel the chicane. That's Dominic Push there in uh, in the number 40 car. Was battling just briefly with Oli Quoker, but uh, a little bit too deep on the brakes coming down into the heavy braking zone. Has to go over the sleeping policeman and actually will take the slowdown penalty as well since he, I think he was a little bit too quick even taking, taking that shortcut. Yeah, I wonder whether he just knew that he wouldn't be able to make the second part of that chicane and use that little bit of a cut through. You do have to get the line right. If not, it will give you a penalty. Dennis Gabrowski now has dropped back to this battle that we were looking at a second ago. Currently headed by Anton Cuisine. He is defending hard from Stephen Bailey by the looks of it. And for Anton Cuisine, he's going to know that he hasn't got much hybrid power now left on this lap because he did use it to get past. Go down three wide and go right down up to towards the pit wall. But looks as though the looks as though the other two haven't got anything to answer. I wonder what they've got 
Got on the hybrid boost, Connor, just to make sure that he couldn't get past. But obviously the speed overlap was too much at this point. Although Gabrowski does need to be careful. If he's saving fuel, he could probably go with not losing as much as Anton Cuisin. On the hybrid boost once again, same kind of move, and the move is already done before they even cross the line. Seems like Hussein does have a lot of reserves, uh, shall we say, in terms of the ERS boost. Being able to do that two laps in a row, but he makes a complete mess of the Red Tavellu Chicane. Gives the opportunity back to Dennis Grabowski now around the outside of the Curva Grande. But yet more ERS boost available for, uh, for Kuzan. Just keeps him ahead. And Stephen Bailey now looking to challenge Grabowski down in towards the Roja. Now down towards the inside, potentially deep on the bridge. Coach Grabowski almost running into the back of Kuzan coming through there. But manages to get away with the skin of his teeth. He, he, Stephen Bailey will get away with the position, but wow, that was so, so close to ending so, so badly. And Dennis Koprovsky has to be careful now. He's lost two positions already on this lap. Will it be three? If so, that's a lot of points he's just lost in the championship. It's not points that he wants to lose in a hurry, because of course he is one of the, I would actually say, one of the great drivers in prototype racing. He isn't a pure racing team for nothing. Jeff Garcia looks down the inside into Ascari. Not the place you want to do it. Very tight chicane for these cars. Very careful as well. You have to be on the power. You do have all that downforce, but if you have too much in these cars, also if you clatter that curb on the inside on the exit, Connery, you will go flying and you will end up in a gravel trap or at least a wall. Yeah, the curbs around here do not take any prisoners, but the, sp the battles in and around your LMP1 field have been absolutely fantastic with the, uh, uh, well, the cat and mouse dynamic with the, uh, with the ERS boost coming down the straights, but uh, things seem to have calmed down a little bit. Jeff Yassi will get the run over Grabowski for P number seven in class, looking for the inside, a little bit caught in two minds here, tries to drag it in, but uh, not able to have the opportunity or at least capitalize on the opportunity down into the heavy braking zone and this will give us uh, actually <laughs> Jeff Chassis the, again these drivers are finding ERS boost out of nowhere this is how the management uh, of that particular facet of the car works easy around the outside for Jeff, Jeff Chassis and uh, you know what would be a useful graphical overlay that we could potentially use if uh, our racing display on their API jack it would it by any chance be how much hybrid the driver has left in yes. this lap and in their batteries. Yes, I make agree. That, make that available for spectators uh, through, <laughs> through the grab seal at least. That would be absolutely fantastic. But uh, right now, we just have to do our best to uh, uh, commentate on the action as it goes right now. But this gives us a little bit of a chance to look at the uh, other classes. The battle for P number one in your GTE field. That one is still very, very close in in indeed. Vecchio and Kazubon. Basically trading lap times at this point, playing the game of the fuel saving. And uh, they both have broken away somewhat to Antti Ahola and Florian Durant. And of course, uh, Christian Dambritz involved in that particular three-car train for the final step of the podium in your GT3 class. So that is definitely one uh, to potentially keep an eye on. Especially when it comes around to the uh, pit stop phase, which, which can absolutely just shake everything up. And I'm going to give a little bit of love to the LMP2 field as well. Kali Janssen currently leading that one from Robert Harris, then Johan Haaf. But they're currently dealing with quite a bit of GTE traffic right now at this stage of the race, Jack. And uh, that is just going to be a constant throughout the rest of this race. This is the stage of the race which I absolutely love with Monte Carlo racing. Because at this point, not only the LMP2 field lapping the GTE field. The LMP1 field is also lapping the GTE field. So you've got three different classes all going all against each other, trying to make their way through the field, not lose as much time as Shabisco and the Allies are almost losing it into Ascari that time as he goes past your LMP2 leader of Carl Janssen. But you also get this dynamic of how the driver's going to risk everything. We've still got 40 minutes remaining in this event. A long way to go. Another 25 laps for your LMP2 leader and around another 27 your LMP1 so a lot can change in that time they do not want to risk it all so early on but we've already seen some drivers do such a thing and also for the GTEs this means that this gives them a good chance to just get that little bit of extra boost in the draft as in fact leads battle for your GTE because of bomb down to the inside Johnny Vigio just going to let him have the position another case of Vigio just going to spend another lap in the draft make sure he can save some fuel yeah, it's basically a case of, okay, you spent a couple of laps in the race lead, and I'll spend a couple of laps in the race lead, uh, just uh, working the fuel numbers, especially to the cars behind, and uh, try and manage the traffic as it comes and goes as well. 
Kali Jansen around the outside of your two GT race leaders. Diving down the inside, though, is Vecchio. That's the uh, Della Rocha chicane, and that's a fantastic move there to get himself back to the race lead. Uh, so Vecchio taking risks uh, potentially a little bit early here. Maybe he has now hit his field numbers, and now he's going to be racing for position. And it looks as though he did force Gazabon to the inside, and that's not what you want to be forced. Nice big sausage dog curve there for you to hit and give yourself a nice bit of floor damage. Nice, that obviously, the Ferrari 4A GT clearly being the choice for the GT class today. Top three are uh, Ferraris at the moment. First Porsche is currently sat in fourth, and that is Florian Denard. I think at some point in the last sort of 15 minutes, Connery, Antti Aula has made his way past the driver of Denard. Not sure where that happened, although I think it was multiple laps ago. Exactly, so your podium in your GTEs right now consists of Vecchio, Kazubon, and Ahola. But that could all change very, very quickly, especially with how close Denard, uh, Dambiet, and uh, a couple of other drivers are to uh, upsetting that particular status quo. But right now, your closest battles are in your GTE field. The battle for the race lead there, you've also got battles between Denard and Dambiet as well. Very, very close coming down the pit straight. And this is the battle for P number four in class right now for your GTE field. But uh, it's going to be disrupted somewhat by Patrick Richter heading his way down the inside of this group of cars going down in towards the Retifilio. But closing up right now is Dambiet in that, uh, in that Porsche. Of course, one of the new GTE cars on the service, uh, well, on the iRacing service. And some drivers really, really preferring it over the likes of the Ferrari and, of course, the Ford GT as well. Damn, it's very close coming down into the Della Roja, but not able to make any opportunity of it. And uh, why do you think, Jack, that the, uh, the Porsche has been so popular? Is it just because it's a new car or is there something about the car that drivers really, really enjoy? I want to say partly it's because it's a new car and partly because there's something about that car which really does attract the drivers. It's a lot of fun. You do have to know how to master it very well. It's not definitely not as easy to drive as the Ferrari. The Ferrari, I'd say, is the car for beginners, the Porsche and the Ford are for the cars that, if you know how to really get one of these GTE cars going, you want to go with one of those, you can get the most out of it. And for some of these drivers, they have been able to. Dan Beert's not going to be able to make a move so far this lap, by the looks of it. Florian Denard looking nice and safe. We do have, this is, of course, the three-car train for position number three, which the TBR car of Andy Ola is currently at the front of. The bird is leading the way. But I expect that, or well, the two drivers behind will not want it to stay that way. Returning to the topic of manufacturers, we do actually have a 4 GT in this race. It is kind of at the back of the field, or at least near the back of the field in your GTE class. It's the 38 of Aidan Campbell there, sticking with the 4 GT, which uh, uh, some drivers uh, find very, very tricky to drive because, uh, as we mentioned before on previous broadcasts, it does drive a lot more like a prototype than it does a GT car, so it doesn't fit within the, uh, within the driving style of many uh, GT drivers. There are, there are a good couple of teams and drivers that can make that 4GT go as quick, if not quicker, than some of the Ferraris and the Porsches out there on circuit. But uh, right now, the front of the field is dominated in GTE by your Ferraris and your Porsches. Yeah, and I but, think... Oh, sorry. Go on, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, that pretty much sums it up, as in fact, we have had a change for the lead in GTE. Uh, Cousin has managed to get his way through, but, yeah, but Johnny Vecchio does it back again at the same place through the Della Roggia, doing the same move, forcing Kazmon offline. But of course, he has now got the driver of Dennis Gabrowski. He's going to split that up. There's also Tanner McCulloch getting his way past that second place GTE machine. So for Johnny Vecchio, he's getting more and more aggressive as the minutes go on, Connery. And I think he needs to stop being careful because if he, if he isn't, that could cause an accident could potentially, especially with all the LMP1 and LMP2 uh, cars that are trying to come through at this moment in time, and it uh, doesn't really seem like there's a, a break in sight just for now, but uh, the battle for P number 3 is still on. In fact, Florian Denard has managed to make his way by anti Ahola on some point on this last lap, and there's also Dambiets that's also very, very close in this particular battle as well. Ahola might actually be looking for an opportunity here down in towards the Parabolic. It closes up in the slipstream versus 
the Porsche are ahead of him, but the thing is, look at that. There's LMP1 traffic trying to come through. There's LMP2 traffic trying to come through. And as a result, he might lose the position here to Dan Biet on the inside of the Parabolica. Three wide between two different classes coming through there then. And uh, Dan Biet and Ahula side by side across the line. It's going to be Battle of the Late Breakers potentially down into the very heavy braking zone of the first turn. But Dan Biet manages to edge his way ahead just for now. But Ahula manages to wrestle the inside line away coming down into the first chicane and Ahola actually ends up keeping position there uh, despite things looking pretty dire at least coming out of the parabolica. Yeah and I think for Antti Ahola it was a case of if he could get that late on the brakes he can make the move. Of course these drivers do have a choice of three different types of brake pads they can use. Low friction, medium friction and high friction. What you could have just seen there is that Dan Bietz is maybe running low or medium friction and they didn't have enough braking force to get the car stopped in the same distance that Antti Ahola did. And he could, of course, be running a slightly different setup on those brakes. Could also just be a case of he felt that he could get the car stopped and he indeed did. So good move by the driver of Ahola. His eyes are once again forward to Florian Denard, who managed to make up that position, get himself back past. Of course, with such heavy braking zones around this circuit, you do want you do want the maximum braking performance. But you know a lot more about setups than I do, especially for these GT cars, Jack. Uh, what are the risks you run with running high friction brake pads? Uh, because uh, it's all well and good having the very very good braking performance, but uh, are there any downsides to running that sort of configuration? If you run the higher friction brake pads, and especially on the high friction brake pads, you have to be very very careful with how much brake force you put through. They, the higher friction, the medium friction pads do favor the drivers who run load cell pedals. Of course, for more, there are, of course, people who can give you much more information about those than I will do on this broadcast, but you do have to be very careful with the braking force. GTE is not fitted with the anti-lock braking systems. They do have traction control. They have two traction control systems, but they do not have ABS, unlike GT3 machinery, which do. GT3 machineries are, of course, made for am more amateur drivers, more amateur driving styles. GTEs are much more for the professionals. Obviously, it came bought from the GT2 class, which became defunct at the end of the 2011 season. Slightly change, slight change of the rule, getting rid of that fabulous GT1 class. Although it was announced today, Connery, the GT2 will be returning in Ooh. SRO competition with a more supercar style of... It's basically merging GT3 and GT4, more supercar style of cars, and a lot of horsepower. Oh, that, is, that will be absolutely fantastic once we see uh, those cars in action. And wasn't there talk of also uh, making the, 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 the prototype classes also more kind of GT-like with hypercars? I, I thought that was something very exciting that uh, was making the rounds as well. Yes, it looks as though the 2020 LMP1 regulations are going to go back to what we saw in the late 90s in the form of the, uh, the road legal cars that were built for a racetrack and then made road legal. But I'm not going to go into that subject. But of course we saw the beautiful Toyota, I think it was, was it the Toyota 1, the TSO 2 and also the, um, the Porsche 911 that won in 1998. And with the drivers, I can remember two of them, it was Stefan Ortelli and Alan McNish, I can't remember the third. And the name kind of escapes me as well. Maybe Ashley Will can help out with that one. But uh, uh, this battle between Denard and Ahola is the one I've been watching right now. They're heading their way through the Parabolica. And actually, we see a couple of uh, just cars deciding to head their way on towards the lane. And in fact, Carlo Labati here down on towards the lane for the LMP2 class. So the driver of number 23 telling now is a good time to pit. And I think uh, with 31 minutes and, uh, well, I'll say that's a few more minutes in the quarter remaining, he might. Uh, struggle a little bit perhaps at the end of this race with the fuel yeah I think most drivers who had now if you got to this point and not had to pit you will be able to get to the end on fuel because of course it's still another minute and a half before you pit and then you're going to spend about a minute on the pit lane so you, oh, most of these drivers are going to be good from here I believe depending on how much fuel they take and in fact, I've just spotted Marcus Hamilton for Breeze Cornella. He's battle for position number two. Three oh. wide into the dirt. Oh, oh. Big squirrel from Fabrice Cornella. He's hard into the wall. Marcus Hamilton does carry on. I think we need to go back and have a look at that coming down into the Della Roggio because that was very close between some GTE traffic oh, more and those two other ones. 
Oh, more contact as well between Hamilton and Cornelius. They are not happy with each other at all. As uh, we'll get the replay up on screen with the uh, confusion with the GT traffic. Marcus Hamilton tried to thread the needle down the middle, but ended up, uh, well, uh, having a little bit bodywork contact there uh, between himself and Cornelius. And Cornelius very, very hard into the Arco barrier as well. And uh, does suffer quite a bit of damage to that car right now on the live pictures, at least. He's struggling to get that car through the Ascari chicane. So I wouldn't be surprised if Cornelius actually just parks it for the day with that much damage. He's babying that car home by the looks of it. It's not doing any more than about 245 kilometers an hour. Marcus Hamilton will probably have a little bit of damage to his car from that little bit of contact into Lesmo 1. But he is carrying on. And in fact, he does bring himself down onto pit lane. Patrick Wolf also does a very similar thing. So this is not an unscheduled stop, Marcus Hamilton. This is the start of the scheduled LMP1 stops. And these guys do now have to get this absolutely perfect. Hit your marks, get your fuel in, back out you go. And also, remember to turn your tyres off. Yeah, exactly. No point in taking those tyres in a race so short as they, they're pinning pretty much on the half an hour mark. So they'll be OK in terms of the fuel to the end of this race as uh, they'll all just get themselves stopped in their box. Taking that fuel to the end, Patrick Wolf, your race leader, uh, gets himself off and away. We'll also see Hamilton and Cornelius make their way out in the not-too-distant future as well. And uh, they might perhaps might also be taking some of the damage repairs here as well, Jack. And uh, Cornelius, he might be in there a little bit longer than Hamilton. I would not be surprised if he was. And for Fabrice Cornelius, I would actually say that's a chance at a good position. Actually gone, Marcus Hamilton. Very long stop for him. Patrick Wolfe, he had a stop of just 19.1 seconds. Mark, uh, Marcus Hamilton is out and away, 43 seconds stop. Michael Schwanzel are just behind him. He's had a stop of 20.6. So I want to win them for Marcus Hamilton. He was getting those damage repairs because he knew that he wasn't going to lose much time to the guys behind. As in fact, he crosses the white line early. That w might he be able to, hmm. or might that give him a stop and go? could potentially if we see him make an unscheduled stop in the next few laps then we know exactly uh, what has happened but battle for well battle between the 32 and the 41 right now in LMP2 this is Tanner McCulloch versus Justin Hoop Hoop looking for the outside line coming through the uh, through the curve of Grande but not able to carry momentum around the outside could potentially go late on the brakes here but the, the side's better of it these guys uh, well these guys in the LMP2 class haven't pitted yet and the only driver in your LMP1 class that hasn't appeared yet is uh, Antoine Cousin, so he is uh, going to get an advantage uh, in terms of the fuel numbers and uh, and uh, the, the fuel time in the pit stop. He'll finally head his way in, and then Patrick Wolf will take back uh, the overall race lead. So that was a very, very, very quick pit stop cycle there for the LMP ones. Everyone in at pretty much the same time. Yeah, and I think that's going to be important for the rest of this race. The only driver who did go a little bit longer is Antoine Cuisine. He is now stopped in his pit box, getting himself refueled. I'm looking at about a 20-second pit stop time to get himself enough fuel to get to the end. Maybe shorter. Could be looking at 16, 17. Of course, he doesn't have to take as much fuel. Marcus Hamilton does carry on going, so maybe he didn't pick up the penalty that we thought he may. And Antoine Cuisine is off and away. I think he's going to lose fourth position and possibly even fifth. So for... Well, no, maybe not. I think he's going to cycle out in about fifth position there for Antoine Cazin, which is a good effort. He might have actually got some time back over Stephen Bailey in that pit stop. Yep, currently seven seconds between them out there on track. So that's a good pit stop cycle there for the driver of the 44. But meanwhile, your LMP2s are in the middle of their pit stop cycle now. So Carly Janssen decided to head his way down off, uh, well, down on the lane just a couple of moments ago. And uh, we've also got Justin Hoop as well deciding that now is a good time to pit for that LMP1 class. We've had, or we've already had the likes of uh, Renny Penquit and uh, Vila Dao. We've got Carlo Labati who have uh, decided to come down in the LMP2 field. So we're still racing on pretty much half the LMP2 field to decide to make their scheduled stops right now. And then we'll see how everyone uh, files themselves out. But uh, battle for your GTE race lead. That one is still very, very close indeed. And of course, Jack, this is the, this is the uh, well, this is the class that will pit the latest in this race there fuel mileage is very very good compared to the other classes and uh well we might see some fireworks between kazubon and vecchio at the end of this one 
We may do indeed, and that is going to be interesting to watch. We can also get the shortest pit stop, because if you can get the shortest pit stop with a gap this small, it could mean that you lose or gain a position, depending on where you are in that train. But at the moment, Gianni Vecchio, he is holding a position. Divock Casavon, actually, so far this season, Connery has been the only driver who's been able to challenge us. Patrick Wolf, your race lead over, or race leader makes his way through. He's been the only person I've seen who's been able to challenge Vecchio up at the front of this GTE field. And it's good to actually see someone finally come along and try and break that streak. Yeah, it's brilliant stuff, but right now at the lead of the LMP2 field, it's a rather one-sided affair, at least as far as Patrick Wolf is concerned, with the 32-second gap over Marcus Houghton. Marcus Houghton, even with taking that long stop, about 20 seconds faster than pretty much everyone else in your LMP1 field, still comes out in second place. So that's the margin that Wolf, Hamilton, and Cornelis had over the entirety of the rest of the LMP1 field. So. Those are how, that's how dominant those particular drivers are right now. As, uh, it'll be interesting to see if a battle springs up between Hamilton and Swanzel here, uh, because Hamilton may actually still have damage to that car. The pit crew can't repair any, everything on these cars, so uh, it could be an opportunity for Swanzel to get himself up into the second step of the podium. As uh, I'm watching Fabrice Colares just drop even further down the timing screens at the moment, he's not going to get back in that car. So, Cornelis, retirement from this race. And it looks as though at the moment Marcus Hamilton has got about a two-second advantage over Michael Schwanzel. As it stands, coming off of lap number 23, just 16 remaining in this event. But looking at lap times last time around, Marcus Hamilton, 1 minute 31.5. Schwanzel, 131.6. So, they are very close on lap times. I believe Schwanzel was slightly quicker last time around. So... Last two laps, I think Transfer has had a net gain of about a tenth, so I'm not sure how much that gap is closing. It will also, depending on where they hit traffic, traffic is going to play into this one heavy. But Monza, if you catch it in the wrong place, you can easily lose two or three seconds. It does seem that the GT battle is where all the, where, well, the GT field is where all the battles are happening right now. We've got the battle for the race lead, we've got battle for P number three, four, and five as well. So that is definitely one that could end up being pretty spicy once the, uh, once the prototype car there of Oli Foka makes his way through up towards the Ascari chicane. Not quite close enough right now to dive their way down the inside for the apex this time. But Ahola has been very, very strong this season in the GTE cars, looking to get himself up onto uh, the podium positions right now. But uh, Denard has been running a very, very good race as well. So. This could be very, very exciting as down into the water power of Arthur they go. Ahola just holding behind just for now, not looking to make those uh, take those risks early on in this second stint. Maybe we'll see a couple more risky moves uh, at places on this circuit within the final 10 minutes, I'd say, Jack. And yeah, Ahola has been trying. He did get through, but Florian Denard has put on a good defence, and that's what we like to see from this GT field. Has Ahola got to run into the chicane this time? He is gaining. No, he's not going to make, be able to get the move done. Not not early enough out of the draft. Of course, Christian Dambiet is still there, waiting to see if anything happens to these two. Your battle for your lead in your GTE class still stands with Fugio from Casabon. And, of course, that probably will not change. I don't think that will change until the pit stops. If it does, we're going to keep an eye on this P3 battle. Defensive from Florian Denard. That's what we like to see in front of like getting close. The driver of Christian or Christopher Dambet getting even closer through that chicane. And this is a battle coming up into the two Lesmos that you need to keep an eye on as Marcus Hamilton now tries to make his way through. Very close to contact between himself and Ahola. Very, very close indeed as he slots himself in between this battle for being number three in the GTE class. But he gets himself off and away with the vastly superior acceleration of that uh, LMP1 car and uh, he'll be quickly into the distance as far as these GT, uh, GT cars are concerned. Rennie Penquick down the inside of the lap traffic as well, coming up towards Ascari as Penquick gets a little bit loose there, uh, coming up through the first apex and a little bit of a slide on the, on the uh, final apex of Ascari as well, but uh, he managed to hold it together and get himself, uh, well, dispatched with the traffic there as uh, this is 
this can be quite frustrating in terms of uh, the multi-class in uh, racing that we have here, Jack, when you have a very, very close battle that you're trying to focus on, but you just have streams of prototypes just always wanting to make their way by. Dambiet's actually diving down on towards the lane, so perhaps a strategic play there from Dambiet to try and get, uh, well, it won't be an undercut based on the tires, but it'll be an undercut in terms of getting some clear air to run in, and uh, that could potentially work out big for him. This could play into Dan Betz's hands very, very well. If he can get this right and make sure that he doesn't lose too much time to Florian Denard and anti Ahola, it will be interesting. Although he has pitted earlier, so it does mean he's going to have to make a slightly longer stop. 20 minutes remaining in this race. But then you also have to question whether those GTs are starting to get low on fuel, Connery, because they do burn mm. more fuel here at Monza. Could it be that over the next couple of laps, GTEs are going to actually pit? Because usually we see them at about the 15, 12 minute mark remaining in the event. And now we're seeing cars pit at the 20 minute mark remaining. Yeah, as you quite rightfully mentioned, there is a very demanding track in terms of uh, the fuel mileage because you're on 100% throttle for the vast, vast majority of uh, your time around the lap. So it just needs to be a little bit more attention paid to the fuel numbers as uh, uh, this could be the trigger for the start of the GTE pit cycle as uh, Kuzan there, the uh, number 44 car, had a little bit of a, con of a con concern there with the GT traffic of anti Ahula there uh, coming down up to, uh, coming up towards the Ascari chicane, but manages to get himself through. He just picked a line and went with it, but uh, Ahula just wasn't moving, which is, well, which is what he's entitled to do since the blue flags are only advisory, but uh, can cause a little bit of confusion. Yeah, and sometimes that can indeed. You've got to be very careful. And of course, you, you, the traffic management is important. If you can get it wrong, and you do get it wrong, as it nearly does between Steve and Bailey. And we see Florian Denard. Out. Yeah, Florian Denard dies down the pit lane, and Ahola stays out for one more. Traffic management is important. You want to keep it nice and clean, you want to keep it nice and safe. And for Steve and Bailey, maybe that was a little bit of impatience. But also, you have to remember, these LMP1 cars are so fast off the corners. You blink in the GTE, you will miss them. They will be two seconds up the road before you can even think about it. Just one of the risks with, with uh, multi-pass racing is anti Ahola. Once uh, we had that confusion off of Parabolica, okay, he actually... I think he just kind of aborted going into the pit lane because it, his trajectory looked like he was going to follow the car ahead in, but he ended up actually staying out there on circuit. So I'm not sure if that was planned for a holo, for a hole up, but or it was a last uh, last minute decision to actually stay out there on the racing circuit. Denard will actually get out ahead of the car of Dan Bietz here, so that undercut really hasn't worked out for Dan Bietz, but. Uh, Sometimes you do have to go for those strategy plays and see if they work out, and if they don't, well, there's not really much that you can do, but we're still waiting for Ahola to head his way down on towards the lane. We're still waiting for the vast majority of your front runners in GTE uh, decide that, to decide to head their way in. And this lap, will we see Ahola try to respond to the move there from Denard, or will he just be uh, sticking to his own strategy here, Jack? I think everyone's going to try and go for their own strategy. I'd probably say for Dan Betts, it hasn't worked off very well. Because, of course, he has taken that slightly longer stop. If he's coming out that far behind Florian Denard, you've only got to beg the question of anti Holo. It's only going to be a couple of seconds behind. Tiago Cazabon has also come down onto the pit lane. So he has completed his stop. Gianni Vicio stays out for one more. Ahola, though, is going to pit this time. So your race leader stays out for another lap in your GTE class. But Ahola currently in second, but in this battle between Dan Betts and Denard, this is going to be an interesting one to watch. Denard is currently exiting the Ascari chicane onto that back straight, heading down to cover Parabolica. And of course, it looks as though Antti Ahola is at the rear of the rear end of your pit lane. He's back going again. Do you know what? I think this might have paid off. We'll just keep an eye on it. He's got a large amount of the pit lane to go. His stall was uh, one of the ones towards the rear of the pit lane. Denard's coming out of the Parabolica right about now. Ahola just approaching those green cones, and those green cones signify you can go 100% throttle off down the pit exit here. Where is Denard? He's coming down, but it's not going to be enough. And Ahola will actually hold position here in uh, the battle for your final podium position in your GTE field. It was actually the... Uh, uh, was well currently the battle for positions down the field but of course we have had uh, a couple of cars stay out there on track so those positions will update shortly once those cars decide to come down in but that has really really worked out well for uh, uh, for the driver of number 19 the finished driver of Antiohola there that has 
just the strategy has just worked out. Uh, the strategy calls you want to be making in this kind of race. The, okay, it's not a full-blown endurance race that we see of four, six, or even twenty-four hours. It's it's only an hour long, but you still have that strategy in mind, and you can see how that hasn't paid off for Dan Betts. You can see how far he's behind the two cars ahead of him. For, well, for Florian Durand, well, he was ahead of Andy Olaf. He's now about two seconds behind. Yeah, so that is a huge loss for the driver of number 21, the, uh, the French driver of Durand. So there's that lot that are on track going on right now in the RLMP2 field. Uh, so actually, just looking at, uh, yeah, Gianni Vecchio has decided to head his way down on towards lane. So this is your GTE race leader. This will be very interesting now to see where he comes out in relation to the driver he was uh, battling with. Fiovolt Kazubon. He's coming out of Power Barca right about now and Vecchio, he has got his service done. We'll be heading between those green cones shortly and I think Vecchio might actually have this. He's able to get up to full speed now and where is Kazubon? He's going to be behind. He's not going to be close enough coming up towards the Retafilio chicane. It's going to be pretty close though within a couple of tenths of a second but Vecchio manages to maintain the race lead after the pit stops. Yeah and that's another you know, good strategy call from Vecchio. He's just kept that pace up. That's what he needed. Clearly Kazubon's idea of pitting early, putting a little bit more fuel in, sacrificing that track time to get clean air hasn't fully paid off and now he's stuck back in second. Chris Fuller is the final car by the looks of it in your field to pit. He is now back out and away currently coming through the very anti-director Filio, that very tight first again. Gianni Michio very wide off of the the um the Della Roggia, but Kazuban looking like he cannot respond because that LMP1 traffic once again making their way through. You do have to be patient around this top section of the corner or this of uh, the uh, circuit Connery because if you aren't, you can very easily cause disaster. Yeah, it's just if you step a foot out of line, then those grass verges and the gravel trap as well uh, have claimed many, many victims in the past coming through that particular section. So you just do have to be a bit cautious coming through there. But looking further back in your GT field, in fact, as well going on for P number six in class, this is Carlos Diegues involved in this one versus uh, Samuel Roth. Up towards Ascaria they go, and uh, right now the pace looks to be uh, relatively even between these drivers. We had Samuel Roth come down on towards the lane that last time by, so we'll, we'll see some representative lap times the next time they head their way across the, uh, the, the the timing line. But uh, some mid-pack battles going on here in your classes. Roth are very, very close, uh, very, very tight, very, very deep on the brakes coming down in towards the Parabolica. Actually has to, uh, I, I believe I almost saw the uh, brake lights flash on there for Roth there as he exited the Parabolica. But that was my eyes deceiving me as he does have the run now down in towards the uh, Retrofilly chicane. Yeah, it looks as though he is going to be looking quite a... Uh, no, no, we've done. Denard, Denard is off. Oh, yes, he is. He's off of the first game. He, he just missed it. He has. Was this battling? No, it wasn't actually battling with any particular driver. He just did it all on his own. Completely missed his breaking points. And we'll get the replay up on screen right now. You'll just see absolutely no one around that number 21 car, but still manages to push himself wide and uh, maybe a, a, just a lapse in concentration there. Yeah, maybe so. It's very difficult breaking zone. That one for that first chicane, the De Rotofilio. And for Denard, he's learnt it the hard way because if you do take there, you do have to serve a slow down penalty. So you not only lose the time for cutting the chicane or for having to slow down and make your way through that very tight, twisty section they put in to make sure you don't go flying through and hitting cars at 260, 270 kilometers an hour, you also lose time with the slowdown. So for Antti Ahola, this has put his position in third a little bit more solid. He has now got an even bigger gap back to fourth. And that battle for, it looks as though actually, the battle for position number between Samuel Roth and Carlos Yeges in GTE has not changed so far. And I don't think it's going to be changing anytime soon. 
certainly looks to be the case, even though they are close out there on circuit. I haven't really seen much side-by-side -side action between these two particular drivers so far. But the thing is, we still have 11 minutes left in this event, so still plenty of time uh, for things to get a little bit hectic, especially in this GTE field where we have the active battles for all of your podium positions and, uh, of course, positions further down in your mid-pack as well. Definitely the most active field uh, here today. The LMP1s were absolutely frantic at the start of the race, but since they've uh, spread out a little bit, the spotlight is now being shone on this GTE field. And can Jan Gianni Vecchio hold on to the race lead in the final 10 minutes of this event? Or can Kazu Bon actually catch right back up to the back and have another opportunity before the end of this race? And that might actually be sooner rather than later because Vecchio had a little bit of an issue with the prototype traffic trying to come through on him. And there's quite a lot of prototype traffic trying to come through on him right now. The prototype's almost going side by side behind Vecchio uh, right now. Now, this is Patrick Richter and Stephen Bailey there. Trying to make their way through. Is, oh, that's so close. Going three wide there as Gabrowski tries to make his way through like a bat out of hell. And up and towards Ascari, he'll get uh, three bits of traffic done in a very, very short space of time indeed. And also a move on Stephen Bailey. I saw that one coming from a long way behind. Gabrowski almost causing his ass with three wide. And you can just see how he's driven off into the distance. Bailey has nothing to answer to the Pure Racing Team Porsche 919 uh, uh, LMB1 hybrids and I think it just shows that the Audi sometimes is a little bit more it's a little bit more hindered off the corner Connery and that GTE lead battle once again has stretched out Gianni Michio uh, he's just moving to the inside but you can see he's trying to take that shortest path down the main straight and that means going all the way off the circuit and almost hugging that pit wall Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting line down there. I haven't really seen many drivers in your GTE field actually go that close to the to the uh, the pit wall on the inside there. So could actually be uh, Vecchio actually making the track as short as possible coming up through the uh, through the parabolica and through onto the pit straight because uh, maybe he has to keep a little bit of an eye uh, on the field numbers. I'm just having a look at how short his stop was. It was. Uh, it was pretty average in terms of GT pit stop times, around about 12 and a half seconds, but uh, Kazu Bon actually had a faster stop by the margin of about a second, so could be Vecchio starting to feel the pressure here, perhaps? Maybe, you, you never know. He's, I wouldn't say he's a driver to ever crack under pressure. Very, very capable driver. He doesn't earn that number one on his car for, for no reason, but I wonder whether he's so used to running this Friday primetime race that He's all of a sudden under pressure from a tier ball Casabon, and Casabon's just maybe showing a side to Johnny Vecchio that we, we almost never see, and I think that's quite interesting to see, is battle for position number five in LMP2. Tanner McCulloch not looking like he was look, uh, grinding to get away his way around Justin Hoop, but for Justin Hoop, he just managed to hold on through a scary that time. Yeah, this is a battle through the first stint as well for LMP2s. Uh, looking actually further forward to the, pro the LMP1 field. The 3 and the 39, they're still going at it. So this is Grabowski versus Stephen Bailey. Grabowski manages to haul position down in towards the very, very slow speed first chicane here at Monza. And uh, that pure racing team car, it's a car that we usually see at the front of prototype fields. And today is no exception, except it's not the car of Dennis Grabowski. It's the car of Patrick Wolf. 30 3.7 seconds all the way back to Marcus Hamilton who got himself involved in an incident with Fabrice Cornet. And speaking of, they both are very close on circuit right now. Cornet has got, gotten back in the car and is still out there or uh, gone out there on circuit, perhaps trying to recover some of the safety rating uh, that uh, Fabrice Cornet has lost in uh, that particular incident. And of course, over the entirety of the Spa 24 hour as well, as Cornet is actually going to fight back with the lapped uh, car over, uh, coming out of the parabolica. But uh, he'll, uh, well, senses will come to him now and uh, just let Marcus Hamilton by as uh, that contact between them earlier on in the race kind of uh, killed whatever battle we had for podium positions inside your MP1 field. Yeah, indeed so. And it just looks as though uh, Fabrice Cornell the damage wasn't too bad for him. And he's back out and running. Clearly wants to try and call back, as he said, call back sort of that safety rating that you lost at Spa. A lot of drivers, I think, are here doing that uh, today. And I think for some drivers, they have struggled doing that. For others, well, they're doing quite well. Of course, you do have a 17 instant limit cap in this event before you do get disqualified. And we're going to be looking at 
the battle between position four, five, and six in LMP2 by the looks of it. Or, and that's Justin Hoop and yeah, Tanner Justin McCulloch. Hoop. Yeah, Justin Hoop and Tanner McCulloch currently on your screens. Yep, they are, and well, down the pit straight they will go. Tanner McCullough sitting in the slipstream here does close up a considerable amount to heading towards the heavy braking zone. Drags it in almost a little bit there, but decides not to go for the move. And you have to say now, he's starting to run out of time. About six minutes to go, so about five laps to go for uh, these guys in your LMP2 field. And uh, looking actually, actually looking back to the, the battle in the GTE field for the race lead, that has actually extended out to over a second now. So Gianni Vecchio has put in some very, very good laps indeed. Actually, three tenths of a second faster than Kazu Bon that last time by to be able to extend his advantage at the front. So maybe he won't be threatened at the end of this race. But uh, Kazu Bon, good, very, very good driver in his own right, could potentially have something to say at the end of this race. But Dieguez versus Samuel Roth, that one is still very much on. And they're going to go side by side into the Della Roja here. So the 16 and the 14 battling down into the, onto the brakes, down through the first apex of the Della Roja. And there's also Bastian Ramis as well, getting himself involved in this particular battle pretty much out of nowhere. Down towards the inside at the first Lesmo, or at least an attempted move down through here. Not able to slot his car in will have to fall behind now for the second Lesmo and that has just given Samuel Roth a little bit of a break now at the front of this train he'll uh, be able to get himself away a little bit as a result of the two cars behind uh, fighting but Bastian Maurice though he has had a pretty good race up from P number 31 overall up into P number around about P number 27 now so that is a fantastic run for him in this race he's uh, going to be proud of that one regardless of how this particular battle ends and of course, it cannot be forgotten that Samuel Roth and Bastien Ramez are teammates, and they could be working together to try and maybe put off either either put off Carlos Diego's or get past and get away from Carlos. Carlos in the Zenith high-speed colours in that Porsche 911 RSR, and you can just see the difference off the corner between the Ferrari and the Porsche. Not too much between those two. Going down the straight once again, and I think for Bastian Ramiz, he's not going to be close enough this time to make an effort into the Retrofilio chicane. But he could be close enough through De La Roggia if he gets a good run through Curva Grande. Ooh, we've got uh, the 44 versus the 3 LMP1 field. So this is the battle for P number 4. Antoine Kazan versus Denis Grabowski. But Grabowski around the outside of both his battle for position and the lap traffic as well. Very neatly done there for Denis Grabowski. But can Kazan reply up towards the Retrofilia chicane? He does have the overspeed, but he's not going to be close enough down into the braking zone and we'll have a bit of the traffic to deal with as well. It's going to compromise Grabowski a little bit as well, so at least uh, Kozan has that going for him, but he doesn't have the line coming through the retrofilia. He's going to lose yet more seconds uh, over his uh, competitor in the number three machine, so that gap is going to extend uh, by quite a margin, but uh, that was pretty neatly done there from Grabowski. Around the outside, overtake button in effect, easy peasy. And he's using the traffic to his advantage, which is what you sometimes need to do in this LMP1 class. And that is why Dennis Grabrowski is, of course, as I said earlier, one of the best. He does know how to manipulate traffic well. He saw the gap. He went for it. For Antoine Cuisine, clearly not looking far enough up the road to be able to see that coming. And, well, that's just a free position there for Dennis Grabrowski. There he goes, up into fourth position. He has got a long way to third, though. Michael Schwanzel is around 20 seconds to the good so there's not much that Dennis Grabowski is going to be able to do in the closing three laps of this race there isn't but one situation that is going on right now Kazu Bon has been so so slow over the past uh, couple of laps two seconds slower than Gianni Vecchio that last time uh, has he short fueled the car a little bit too much here yeah, he did have one of the shortest pit stop times uh, in fact, he had the shortest pit stop time in the entirety of the GTE field. Maybe he's made a mistake on the fuel here. He's having to lift and coast down into the corners. You never know, and that could be a possibility. And if it is so, that means that he may struggle to get to the end. He, is gone, he has gone longer than a lot of other cars out there that are in the GTE field. So maybe, maybe he has just got that fuel strategy wrong. And that, that could be a big blow for that driver. Absolutely. We'll continue to monitor it, of course, but uh, 
uh, it'll be a huge shame if Kazuban does, uh, well, uh, lose yet more positions here. As Antio Ahola, speaking of losing positions, uh, Antio Ahola is going to be very, very close over the next couple of laps unless Kazuban uh, picks up the pace. But the thing is, he might not actually just ha not might not actually have a choice in that matter if he wants to get to the end of the race. Yeah, and I think to get to the end of the race, he is going to have to fuel save. He's got two more laps to complete after this one. It's going to be a 35 lap race for your GTE field. And it's going to be a 41 lap race for your LMP1 field. Your leader is currently coming through Lesmo number two. So in about um, 45 seconds, 50 seconds time, the white flag will fly here at Monza. We just had someone park on the outside of the uh, of Curva Grande. That was the number nine of Jorge Valls. Actually got himself involved in an incident down into the rectifilio with the car uh, of Dennis Branch. Branch getting tagged around a little bit, and the car swung back round and tagged Valls around as well. So uh, a little bit of <laughs> perhaps revenge there with the cars spinning out through that particular section of circuits, and Valls actually retiring the car. Uh, maybe a little bit too much damage there as all. Oh, there's another incident coming through. Ooh, that is the Retifilio. Dennis Grabowski involved in this one with Oli Kvuka, so not a battle for position, and uh, it was concerned with the lack of traffic. Florian Denard also involved in this, so Denard actually tagged the car of Kvuka around, so a, G a GT car hitting a prototype car from behind, which isn't something you usually see, I have to admit. And Dennis Grabowski getting collected in it, so late race drama here. And Denard's just done it again. He's just ran into the back of Antoine Cuisine through the Della Roggia second time on this lap. I think Denard needs to calm down. He's still got another lap and a half to go. And yeah, that was just an unfortunate incident. Quokka could not do anything. It looks as though Dabros Dabrowski did try and go on the outside, but did not make it work. Patrick Wolf, on the other hand, has crossed the line. The white half flag has flown. Coming through Lesmo 2 for the final time. I think it's got to be said that he has had a dominating run here today. Yeah, there's no other word for it. Dominating basically just sums it up, and uh, he only has around about, uh, well, a third of a lap to go. He'll slow it right down. He doesn't want any confusion with the GT car ahead of him. Just he has enough of a buffer uh, to the car behind to actually just go at snail's pace for the next couple of corners. And Patrick Wolf, absolute dominance at the front of the field, was challenged early on by the likes of his teammate from Greece, Colonialis. Marcus Hamilton was involved in that fight as well, but a little bit of contact behind meant that Patrick Wolf can get up to the front of the field, pull away, check and flag out for Patrick Wolf. He will win here, round number seven of the RS Le Mans series at Monza for the LMP1 field. Antoine Cuzon and Denis Grabowski, they actually have a late, uh, late race swap for position. Bailey also through as Gabrowski having an issue here he lost two positions coming through the Curva Grande which has put him back now into P number six so this battle isn't over right now for P number four five and six in your LMP1 field this is the closest battle of anyone out there on circuit Carly Jansen has headed his way across the line to take the win for LMP2 we'll see this battle out now for P number four five and six Grabowski back on on the ERS boost up towards the Ascari chicane, trying to wrestle the position away from Stephen Bailey. Bailey late on the brakes in towards Ascari, makes the apex of the corner as well. Manages to get himself through the final couple of apexes, but gets the car loose. There goes Grabowski on his way through down towards the Parabolka, so he will gain P number five, uh, unless Stephen Bailey has a huge ERS boost coming out of the Parabolka, but it's such a short run to the line that it may not matter anyway. Antoine Kazan will take P number four, Grabowski P number five, Bailey will have to sell for P number six and behind Gianni Vecchio heads his way through the curve of Barabolica it battles early on with fuel bolt Kazubon, but Kazubon with fuel issues at the end of the race mean that Gianni Vecchio takes the race win in GTE by quite a comfortable margin. Kazubon and Hohola so close across the line, but Kazubon manages to hold on with the fuel issues for P number two there. Fantastic race uh, at the end there with your LMP1 cars just outside the podium positions. But uh, in terms of the rest of the race, GTEs was where it's at. Unfortunately, we didn't get the grandstand finish for the race lead but uh, we did have uh, almost a very close battle coming towards the line for P number two instead the rest of your runners and you know, their way across the line right now to finish this event a little bit hectic there at the end Jack 
Yeah, and I think it, it just shows that it's not. It's about where you are once you cross the line after one hour and not after 40 minutes. Of course, not over till the flat lady sings and we are about to take you down to your final race finishing positions. Patrick Wolf will take the LMP1 win by 36.4 seconds. That is a huge, huge gap over the nearest competitor of Marcus Hamilton, about one third uh, of a whole lap there separating P number one and P number two. Michael Schwanzel will pick himself up the final step on the podium after starting P number five and Antoine Cousin, a good charge through the field. P number 11 in LMP1 gets himself P number four when all is said and done. Dennis Grabowski there involved in that late, late race fight with himself and Stephen Bailey and he'll come out on top in terms of that particular one. P number five for him, Stephen Bailey P number six. Jeff Giassi, the first car, a lap down in P number seven. Dominic Push, P number eight. Uh, Olive Poker, P number nine. Ishmael Yakubu, P number 10 in class. And your, uh, well, your car's many laps down in your LMP1 cars, not necessarily uh, retirement since Fabrice Cornelis did get back in the car to finish this event. Kazuki Yumashima out with an early race incident. Sayandra and David Soranzo also retiring their particular efforts as well. Looking at LMP2 though, Carly Janssen takes the race win in that particular class with Robert Harris taking P number two. Johan Haaf, a good result for him, P number three. Patrick Richter, P number four. Justin Hoop, P number five. And Tanner McCulloch, P number six. We saw the fantastic battling throughout the race between Hoop and McCulloch uh, for those particular positions in class, but Hoop manages to come out on top. Gula's mate there further behind, Rene Penquit and Loic Gula Daro there, as I'm <laughs> going to struggle with that pronunciation pretty much forever. But your only retirement in your LMP2 field, Carlo Labati, down 12 laps. GTE field now, GTE race results, Gianni Vecchio coming out on top, Theobald Kazubon, P number two, Antti Ahola finishing out on the final step of the podium after that fantastic battle in the middle of the race that he had with Krista Dambiet, Florian Durand, we've got Carlos Diegues there further back as well, P number 25 overall for him, Barry Morrison there, P number 26 overall, Bastian Ramis, Chris Fuller behind them, Samuel Roth and Bruno Fontalba uh, positions further down as well. You got Christian Boo, Timo Gorlick, you got Aidan Campbell, Dennis Branch, Andy Pez, Stephen Ebert, Jorge Valls, Jan Senkowski, and Simeon Lynch will round out your entirety of your 44 car race results. Well, we'll just head out to your just a little bit of commercial break. Wait to see if we're going to see a couple of drivers come in for their post-race interviews. We'll see you after this. That almost. Hello. Hello, is there anybody out there? Welcome back to the post-race show for round number seven at Monza for the iRacing Le Mans series. We do have a couple of drivers to talk to after that event, and why not get the winner of your GTE field in the commentary booth right now? It's going to be Gianni Vecchio, and he's going to be standing by with Jack Styles. Gianni Vestfall, 
congratulations on another class win in the Iris Single One series. You had a bit of a challenge today from uh, the driver of Kazi Bon. Was he ever a was he ever a threat to you? Yeah, I'm a bit threat because like my plan A for the race was to run away, which is like normal plan. But because it's Monza, it's really easy just to follow to follow the guy in front because like the huge draft. And yeah, then as you as you maybe saw, like we we swapped the lead quite a few times because I actually want to save even more fuel than I did um, actually. So yeah, I think it, in the end I took the advantage because I saved way more fuel. And of course, fuel saving at Monza is very important. You will agree that strategy did come into play. You managed to pull a bit of a bit, little bit of a gap, and I have a feeling Kazuban at the end was was fuel saving. So another one, another thing that really does play into this race is traffic management from the prototype cars. How did you find that today? Yeah, it's um, a big thing here because, like, my my, my strategy was was like if um, T board is in front of me, and I saw in the relative that like a uh, couple of um, cars were coming, I'd, I actually tried to overtake him so I can make sure that some cars are between us if when they try to overtake us. So I managed it. A f I managed it a few times, but it didn't like it didn't work at all. And of course, looking to the up forward to the, the remaining races of the season, I think if uh, Kazaban does come back and gives you a challenge, are you worried he might be able to get some class wins off you? Yeah, um, yeah, it's gonna be tough. Probably also because there's there are a lot of few different guys um, which run the series like Jack Sedwig or uh, Patrick Christoph Moser. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a challenge. And before we go and let you celebrate with your team, who would you like to give a shout out to today? Yeah, the whole team. Um, like also a shout out to our Pew Driving School and to our sponsors. And yeah. Well, that is Gianni Vecchio. He finished first today in GTE. Had a good challenge from T-Bolt Kazabon, but could not. He held him off and Kazabon could not fight back. Back to you, Connery. Yeah, exactly. And we also have another GTE driver in the commentary booth as well. That's Antti Ahola, which uh, I, I know I struggle with that last name a lot, considering <laughs> with the... Uh, I'm pretty sure you've watched the uh, previous broadcasts back, Antti, uh, uh, with me struggling with that. But uh, you had a yeah, fairly interesting race. Yeah, you had a fairly interesting race today, battling for uh, that final step on the podium. And uh, I kind of want to take you back to the, you know, the start of that pit stop cycle where you almost followed Denard into the pits, but decided to back out last minute. Was that a last minute decision or just uh, were you just following in the tri tire tracks of the car ahead? Uh, I was just trying to get every inch of the draft because I knew it, it would be tight coming out of the pits in my pit stop. So uh, I just wanted to get the best uh, possible st speed to the main straight and then just push like hell through the final lap for the pit stop so that I would be in front of uh, Florian. Yeah, it did really work. Well, worked out well in your favor. You had uh, uh, the, the shortest pit stop of anyone in that particular battle, which just uh, allowed you to get out ahead and uh, with a comfortable margin over the cars behind. And, uh, and then in the, in the second stint, was there uh, was there any concern about cars behind? Uh, because you also had Florian Denard uh, also involved in that particular battle, but you had to take a little bit of a off track excursion coming through the Retrofilia chicane uh, that pretty much secured yourself in P number three. But uh, uh, in, in terms of that second, second sense, just how did it go for you? What was your strategy after that stop? Well, of course, after I saw that uh, I was in front, the main objective just, was just to push, push hard and uh, avoid any mistakes. But uh, I noticed that I feel underfilled by one liter, so I had to also save fuel a little bit uh, during the laps. But uh, th thankfully, to my luck, uh, Flor Floria made the mistake. So I was able to well, uh, save even even more for the field just to get to the end, even though uh, Christopher was ca was catching me. And then uh, at the very end, I also noticed that uh, Thibault was saving even more field than I, so uh, I almost caught up to him. Just uh, would, would have needed one more lap. Yeah, it's, it's always a case of needing just one more lap uh, to be able to make the pass. And it would have been a pretty easy pass, considering how much uh, Kazuman was fuel saving. He actually took about two seconds less fuel than you did. So he, uh, he was really struggling to get to the end of the race, but uh, he didn't manage to hold on. But uh, in, in terms of the rest of the season now, 
uh, looking at the races to come, uh, any tracks uh, that you that you're looking forward to? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Do you need me to list them for you? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the schedule right now, but um, I think I might give Daytona and Sebring a go because ILMS isn't the the series that I'm actively running in iRacing, so um, just Road American Monza that are one of my favorite tracks, so decided to do these races on this particular time on a Friday. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Thank you very much for the action that you provided out there on circuit as well. There's Antti Ahola, the Finnish driver for Team Bushfink Racing there, Jack, and uh, just an overall good race from everyone involved here. Yeah, I think it was a, a very good race, very clean race for the most part from these drivers today. And that's what we like to see on Friday night prime time. We, we like to show off the best drivers that we possibly can here on the R Racing service. And for those of you who have not ever experienced how enjoyable the sim is, go and have a go. Get yourself a, a couple of months subscription and, and just try it for yourself. You never know. You may like it. And also, don't forget to subscribe here on the iRacing Esports Network. Watch that subscribe account a little higher. Actually, press the like button, as I'm actually feeling much more like a YouTuber right now and saying those things. But uh, that's about all we have time for here on RaceBot TV, Friday primetime, streaming live on RaceBot TV and the iRacing Esports Network. Join us next week for some racing at Silverstone. Goodbye.